to come together and to fellowship, praise, and to worship uh, His holy name today. Um, I'm so thankful for this church. I just feel like saying just how thankful I am for the church and everyone that's in it and the fellowship and the love that we all share with one another. Truly, truly feels like a family, uh, which we are all family in the body of Christ. Um, but I feel like we are even more knitted together soul-wise with one another since we started this journey together. Praise God. Amen. Um, been preaching on the strong men of the Bible, uh, which are the strongholds that Satan likes to place God's children in. And of course, God's children are ill-equipped to stand up against it because they're not taught about it. And we've been on this journey for several months, and as long as the Lord continues to lead me in this direction, then I will continue to teach on this. Um, it's so important that we understand what is all, what all the tools that Satan has to use against us to try to keep us from fulfilling the purpose that God has placed upon us. He knows what God has planned for you. So therefore, He wants to stop you. He wants to knock you off that path. He wants to take you into a place of darkness. He wants you to lose your way. He wants to ruin your relationships and your marriages. Uh, he, wants, he wants to ruin this church. I guarantee you that. He don't like this place at all. Uh, but as long as we are breathing and have breath in our lungs, we are going to teach the Word of God in this house. Can I get an amen? Amen. Praise God. So I started last week or the week before. Can't really remember which week I started this, but um, we are talking about the spirit of whoredoms is the strong man that we are doing today. And under each strong man that Satan uses against us, he has a hierarchy of spirits and demons and devils that even work under that. And they're always around. Always looking for an opportunity to come into your life and make you fall. Um, and if we allow that, then I'm going to tell you something. All Satan needs is a little crack in that armor. And he'll come busting through that wide open if you allow it. So we're going to look at under the spirit of whoredoms. There's two spirits under that we're going to talk about today, which is going to talk about the spirit of the soul or body prostitution. That is going to be in the physical sense. It is in the spiritual sense. Amen. And the love for money uh, is what we're going to talk about today. Alright, so we're going to pick it up in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 17 and 18. Deuteronomy 23, 17 and 18. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel nor a sodomite in the sons of Israel. Now first of all, I want to say that there is a lot deeper meaning to this scripture that I will not be covering today, but I can assure you, I know God's going to let me come back around to it one of these days Amen. if something needs to be understood. Uh, but, but for what we are teaching today, the word here is not as you would think in the English when it says the whore. In the Hebrew, it is Kadesh. And it means a temple prostitute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a prostitute that they would have come in into the Baal temple. But what, you know, you say, well, that's Baal. We don't worship false idols and do all the things that they were doing in there. Uh, but actually, we do do some of those. But this was literally, they would bring in literally a prostitute to raise money. Okay? Instead of teaching people the Word of God. Do you see any, do you see any of that going on today? Do you see that in churches today? It's about the money. Mm -hmm. Instead of being about saving God's children right. and teaching them God's Word. The, re the religious system has become a prostitute in our country, in our nation, in our world today. Ministers behind a pulpit. Why? For the money. We don't get to see that much here, but I guarantee you it goes on a lot because it's in this Bible a lot. There are a lot of churches out there today and the minister is standing by behind the pulpit and he is prostituting himself out. Why? Because he's not teaching you the Word of God and he is doing it for the money. Amen. And that's sad to say. Now, I don't know how many mega churches you have been in uh, across the United States, but if you go into a mega church, they're selling coffee. 
You get your free here, correct? Amen. God provides that for us. I ain't going to charge somebody for it. Alright, you go in there, you can go to the coffee bar, you can buy t-shirts, you can buy memorabilia. Is that not is that supposed to take place in God's house? No, not at all. It is a place for us to teach God's children. It is a place to help people that are lost in the world today. The religious system, which we do not practice religion, religion is not Christianity. Christianity is following Christ. And putting him at the center of that. It's not geared towards money. Now some of you may be too young to know who Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were back in the day. They were so filthy rich in the ministry, their dog had its own house with heat and air. <laughs> you, look at, you look at these uh, mega churches today and you've got million dollar homes. Yeah. Private jets. And I, I tell you what, what come to me when I was studying this, I thought, how can they do that? How can they live like that when we have got people living on the streets that are homeless? Right. Have no food. Have no roof over their head. Have no clothing. Now, not only are they physically hungry, but they are also being spiritually robbed of a spiritual meal. Amen. Now, that's not to say if there's some church out there that, and, and it's being blessed by the blessings of God, that's one thing. But when it's not blessed of God, that's a total different thing. They are prostituting themselves out for money. To raise money. To beg for money. That is their sole focus instead of teaching God's Word. And God's children are starving to death for the Word of God. Amen. And hope and peace in their lives today. And it's not being given to them in these big mega churches. God's children are spiritually sick <laughs> And instead of drawing them in with God's Word, and instead, instead of teaching them God's Word, which prepares us, and I've been saying this in the last few sermons, why do you come here on Sunday? To get your tank filled. That's right. To get your spiritual meal to strengthen you to face another day and a week in this life. Right. So if you're not getting that when you come here, you came in empty and you're going to leave empty. Right. Come on. Unless you're studying for yourself, which you should all be doing in reading your Bibles. But the minister that stands behind this pulpit has taken the job from God and the calling from God and we have a responsibility as the shepherd of the church. And that is to feed the flock. That is what we're supposed to do. 2 Peter 2.17 I quote this uh, scripture very often. These very people, these are wells without water. Who is our living water? It is Jesus Christ. And we are supposed to go to that well to get that water which is everlasting life. But these folks are wells without water. What good are they? Well, God, in the eyes of God, they ain't worth nothing. Because they're not teaching His children. And clouds that are carried away with the tempest to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Those that are out there doing it for the money, what did it just say was going to become of them? This is a very serious calling. But I always say there are, there are many called, but only a few chosen from God to do this work. And I can't help to say this. I've not been to the insemination school. I've not been educated by man. I have been educated by the Holy Spirit of God. I'm not going to have a religious system telling me what to think and what to teach. I am going to go with the Holy Spirit of God. He does the leading. He does the directing. Yes, I have to do my due diligence teaching every week and study His Word, which is a privilege and an honor, and I love to do it anyway. You have to give Him something to work with, but then it's the Holy Spirit that does the teaching. So many people at the end of service will say to me, and I've had this happen a lot lately, they're saying, I felt like you were talking right to me. Hallelujah. God knows what each and every person sitting in these pews today, He knows what you need right now. Amen. And then the message that He has placed on my heart, it's going to hit you according to what God wants you to hear. <laughs> I don't have any no, I don't know what y'all need. 
I know you need to hear the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. But God specifically knows what you need. And if He prepares the message, then it is going to hit you where it is supposed to. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Verse 18. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of thy God, the Lord thy God, for any thou, for even both there, these are an abomination unto, unto the Lord God. Amen. In other words, money from the temple harlot. You know, even a congregation commit, can commit whoredoms against God yes. when they sit, and I say this a lot too, they'll sit in a church knowing the minister is not teaching them the truth, but yet they stay there and they, they when you hear it so many different times, then you start to believe it. Well, then are you not a prostitute or a whore against God because Amen. you are now following a doctrine that is not according to the Word of God? You are following the words of a man that is misleading his children. It falls on you to be on the Word of God and to read your Bible. It brings the dog into this, and this is kind of touching on the on the uh, a little bit of a deeper level. When I say the Baal temple worship, it's a man-like dog because that's the position they hold to earn the money for the temple. Right. And I know that's true, but that is the truth. And the Hebrew word here is different. It is cadet instead of kadesh. And that means a male prostitute. They debase themselves for money. Yep. Do ministers not debase themselves for money today? They do. Yes, they do. They do it for the money. The men behind the pulpits prostituting themselves out to the highest bidder. I'll never forget when God called me back to the ministry. And I started at a little old church over there in Waynesboro off of Hall Creek. And the person that had talked to me about ministering, one of the men that had talked to me about being coming back to being a minister, they said, you know, you're only going to get paid $300 a month. I said, okay, I, that's more than I was making before. I mean, so that wasn't no big deal. And then he said, but don't worry about it because the better job you do, the bigger church you will get and the more money you will make. I'm not in it for the money. Uh -uh. I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it to help God's children and to save souls. My, my wife shared a story with me last week, which been married 40 years, or coming up on 40 years, and I didn't even know this. We went to the same youth group together in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And she is 16 years old, lives with her parents, and her parents don't need one of them to go to church. The church was her home, her uh, very existence, her friends, and all those good things. Two men from that church come and pay a visit to her house. 16 years old. And they wanted her to sign something saying how much money that she was willing to tithe every week. 16 years old. They're in it for the money. Right. Uncle Doug, which he is not here today, uh, a story that I share often after I first came back into the ministry. I went to their house uh, whatever day it was, and he was out at the shop, we sat down, we talked, and I witnessed to him, and we talked about the Bible. And he says, well, you know, he says, I like what you have to say. I'm thinking, I like what the Holy Spirit's telling me to tell you. He said, uh, there's this church that I visited, I really liked it. He said, and I went back several times. He said, you know, the funny thing was, each and every time I went, the minister never come and introduced himself to me. He said, but on that third or fourth time that I came, the minister finally come up to me and shook my hand and said, hey, I noticed you've been coming to church. We need to get you in membership so you can tithe. Oh. Prostitutes standing behind the pulpits of God today. Under no circumstances bring the price of a harlot, male or female, into the house of God. Let's go see what Christ had to say about this. So let's go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And we're going to start with verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. 
And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Folks, Passover is the high Sabbath of the year. That is when the Lamb shed the blood so that we would have the covering of the blood of Christ upon our lives so that the death angel will pass you over. Because when you've got that Passover blood of the Lamb, the death angel has no... He has to pass you over. Because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Now keeping in mind what this is about again, the temple harlots and the prostitution physical and spiritual. Verse 13 or verse 14 and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money. Money changers. Temple harlots. Church today actually have ATMs in them. I mean, they got them right up there beside the front door. When you come in, there's an ATM for you to please put your, take your money out of it and give it to us. God didn't like bears. God is not going to bless a ministry that has to stand up and beg people for money each and every time they come in this house. What you give to God is between you and God. Yes, we are supposed to give our best, Amen. our first fruits to God. Yes. It is for God's house. It is for God's ministry to yes. further God's ministry. That's what it's for. Preach, brother. ATM in the church. I couldn't even imagine. I'm still waiting on my jet, though. I want y'all to know that. Mm. You got it on the order. Yeah, thank you. Right in the house of God. If you give God something, you give your best yes. of your flock, your harvest, and from your own personal belongings. And share it with the house of God. But now they become shopping centers. ATMs. A money maker. Let's look how Christ feels about that. And when He had made a scourge of small cords. I love this scripture. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He, he had a whip. And it had five strands on it. And a lot of people, when I teach this, they say, you can't tell me Jesus did that. Yes, He did. It's in the Word of God. He sure did. And when He made a scourge of small cords, He drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Yes. He took that cat of nine tails and He whipped them and run them out of that temple that day. And the coins were ringing off the marble floors as that table hit the floor. Hallelujah. He cleaned house. There is something called righteous indignation, folks. Jesus Christ was perfect. Some people say, well, Jesus lost His temper. No, He didn't. Righteous indignation. He had a right to run them out of that building. Amen. Cleaned house. And the crazy thing is, I don't know why people don't understand who it was that crucified Christ. The high priest. Yes. The high priest of the church had him crucified. Why? I just told you why. He ran them out of that temple. He did away with their business. Right. So you don't think all that money that they're in, they got a banker sitting right there. And then they're going to sell oxen and dove and lamb and all these different things. You don't think that the temple priest got a cut of that? Come on. He was hurting their prophets. So they killed him. And I dare to say if Jesus Christ walked this earth again today, that they would try to kill him again. Because Jesus Christ would do the same exact thing. But the problem is, he's not a baby in a manger. He didn't come here humbly. He's coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. When His feet touch the Mount of Olives, He will destroy every church that is not doing His will. That's right. And He will destroy the false prophets and the prostitutes behind the pulpits as well. Amen. I guarantee if they knew exactly what their punishment would be, they would make sure to start studying the Word of God and make sure that they had answered a calling from God and not somebody else. It is a calling that I do not take lightly at all. <clears throat> Alright, verse 16. And he said unto them that sold the doves, Take these things hence. Yes. Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Right. And his disciples remembered that it is written, The zeal of thine house have eaten it up. Psalm 69.9 is what that quote comes from. God's house is a house of prayer. Yes. 
God's house is a place to help God's children, to give them hope, to help them obtain salvation. It is not supposed to be about money. Alright, now, God's house is not a place to come. It's not supposed to be a house of boredoms. That's right. It's supposed to be a place of hope and prayer and learning God's Word. Amen. Alright, now we're going to go to 1 Timothy 6, starting with verse 7. And this part of the study is, which co correlates with the one I just did, is still about the love of money. First Timothy chapter 6 starting with verse 7.
He's not going to do it all for you. I have a lot of people say, Brother, you don't understand, no, God don't ever do nothing for me. And I say, What do you do for God? Oh, oh that gets their attention. That's right. You ain't going to sit up on your butt and do nothing and expect God to bless your life. You have to do your part. You have to get up and you have to roll up your sleeves and you've got to go to work. Amen. Does not the book of Thessalonians say those that do not work shall not eat? Amen. God don't work that way. We have to do our part. Oh. Ministers begging for money. And I hate to use this one as an example, but I'm going to use it anyway. And that's Caleb. Now everybody loves Caleb. Everybody, anybody here listen to Caleb radio? Amen. Love their station. Love all the music that they play and all that stuff. But the begging for money part is what gets me about that ministry. Right. Every quarter. Every quarter, every three months, and that they will do, they will beg for money for a week's solid until they hit their goal. Now, me and my wife have had a discussion about this many times. You do not have to beg for money if you are doing God's work. That's right. If you are truly doing God's work and you are doing it the way that God has laid it out, He will bless that ministry. That's right. That's right. Amen. Maybe somebody from Caleb's going to hear that and don't get mad at me. <laughs> but I mean, it's true. I would rather listen to the commercials, you know, because most radio stations are financed by their advertisements. I would rather listen to commercials than listen to somebody beg each and every day for week in and week out. How many times do you hear me teach about tithing up here? You don't. How many churches have you been in and each and every Sunday the minister is begging for money? There's something wrong with that ministry. Don't you know that God will add on to them, I mean, more abundantly than they could ever imagine if they just do it God's way? I mean, God blesses me and I don't care to tell you He blesses me. But I try to do it God's way. And when you try God counts that as perfect. Right. That you care enough about Him to try to overcome whatever it is you've got to overcome in your life today. You may fall down and you may fail. Get back up and try to do what's right each and every day. Matthew 6, 26. Behold the fowls or the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more better than they? Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. That's right. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation yes. and a snare and into many foolish, hurtful lusts right. which drown men in destruction and perdition. The desire to be wealthy and they forget about God. That's right. When you are planting wealth outside of what faith gives and brings, it robs you of your eternal wealth. It does. You've lost focus on God. <laughs> I got news for you. you ain't going to have that wealth long. Nope. No. You will not have it for long. And not relying on God. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where throws, droves do not break through and steal. Thieves, I'm sorry. And where thieves do not break through and steal. Right. Where are you laying up your treasures today? Are you laying it up here? Uh -uh. Are you laying it up in heaven? Yeah. I got news for you. If you lay it up in heaven, you're going to have it here. That's right. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Verse 10. For the love of money is not the root, is the root of all evil. Yes. It is not the money that is evil. It is the love of money. If that is all you are going to focus on in your life is money instead of serving God, doing things God's way, 
Folks, it is evil in the eyes of God. I know I've taught all my life that, that everybody always said, well, money's evil, money's evil. We all got to have money because we got to pay bills, we got to buy groceries and buy gas and support our families and our children. Amen. But our main focus and goal should not be about attaining wealth. Amen. Did it not just say that He would take care of you? I mean, if He knows when a bird falls from the sky, you don't think that He don't know when you're going through something? You don't think He don't know that you need something? Of course He does. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And that's exactly what they're going to end up with. They might have a pocket full of money, but God's going to put a hole in it. And that money's just going to trickle right down your leg and it's going to go right back into the dirt. And you ain't going to have nothing. That's right. Put God first. The money comes from doing things God's way. And He will add all these things to you. Don't become a great portal in the eyes of God. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. You better turn around and run and tear. Don't make that be your main focus in this life. But thou, O man of God, flee from these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Those things build character. True character. When we follow God's way and they please God. They will bring you blessings. You don't have to beg for those blessings. God's going to give you those blessings. It's okay to have money, but don't let that be your main motivation, especially in a ministry, because God is going to trick you going right out the gate. That's right. <clears throat> it says flee. Realize that helping God's children is more important than money. I can't help but say this too. If God is blessing you, bless somebody else. Amen. Amen. That's right. How could you not? It'd be like the rich man stepping over Lazarus and the dogs were licking his sores and the dogs at the gate had more compassion on that man That's than right. the rich man did. Come on. When God blesses you, it, you ought, and I ain't telling you what to do, That's you got free will, but you ought to be blessing other people too. Amen. I guarantee you that'll make you feel better than any amount of money. To see what we're offering them today is Jesus Christ. And that can't be bought or sold, right. folks. Amen. Luke 12, 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's right. I possess eternal life. How about you? Amen. Amen. 